the mitotic spindle, the whole thing, the proteins and the chromosomes, was isolated in 1952 by Mazia and Dan. And this brought forward the hope that we'd be able to understand what this was made of and maybe how it works. And there was a period of perhaps 10 years in which many of us came, isolated spindles, tried to isolate from them the, the proteins, and we failed because the structure was too complex, there were too many proteins, and we just didn't have an assay. We knew that there was a fibrous protein, that is to say a filament, because from the work of Shinya Inoue, he had shown that the spindle is birefringent, and therefore it must be, a, to some extent, a parallel array of filamentous proteins, and we wanted to find out what that filament was. And Shinya Inoue will also give a talk on this subject, which uh, I suggest strongly that you listen to as well. So we tried and failed both on sea urchin eggs and growing cells in culture uh, and isolating the proteins, and nothing came out of it. There were too many. So we had the idea that maybe we could use a drug called colchicine. A whole book had been written on colchicine, and it was known to be specific, in, apparently specific, in blocking cell division, although there were controversies as to what this really meant. Maybe it didn't block cell division, maybe it stimulated cell division. But everything suggested that this was a compound that we might be able to use if a long shot suggestion might be correct, that this specific molecule was binding in some way, in, or interfering in some way with the action of the formation of the spindle fibers. And so we set out to synthesize a tritium-labeled colchicine because this would allow us to see if it was binding to something in the cell. Uh, this could be done by a method which was nonspecific but easily done, and we purified the tritium-labeled colchicine and indeed showed that it was taken up by cells in tissue culture as well as into sea urchins, eggs, which we had some sea urchins in the lab too, and that it was concentrated by the cell, which told us that it was binding to some component that was there in, in relatively large amounts. It couldn't be an enzyme. It had to be a possibly a structural protein. So it seemed like that this was worth trying. It seemed, on the other hand, that the chances of this project succeeding were very, very small because it was a long shot idea and I didn't like at first to give it to a graduate student to work on because he could have wasted two or three years and got nowhere. But anyway, uh, Gary Borisi joined the lab around that time and uh, well, what did you want to do, Gary, when you got to the lab? I mean, before getting on the project, I was an undergrad uh, at the University of Chicago and Frank Child was one of my professors and he was teaching biology and showed me how cells divide. Actually, we saw living cells divide, and I asked him, you know, rather naively, like all undergraduates are, I suppose, uh, well, how does it work? What's the mechanism? And there, it was clear that there was no molecular understanding of the mechanism. And uh, this is before I, I learned about your lab, but uh, I thought this is a fantastic problem to be studying. It's a problem that's worth spending one's research career on. And then after graduating and looking at graduate schools, I learned about your work with colchicine and I thought, oh my God, this is uh, the molecular entree to the problem of mitosis. So that's why I wanted to join the lab. Yeah. So then what we had to do was to get an assay and that was to get some way that bound to the protein, we could spin it off, separate it on a column, later to put it onto DEAE filter paper. And then what we could do would be to make an extract from the cell, spin off the particles, look at the protein, and say, well, how much colchicine is bound? And then we could do what biochemists do. We fractionate it into different test tubes and test each tube to see how much colchicine binding activity. And then, then we could go, I mean, because that was the whole issue. An, we are trying to isolate the railroad tracks, and there's no assay for railroad tracks. It's not an enzyme. And so the whole trick here was to find an assay. And it was a long shot bet, but it turned out, as the work went on, and Gary 
and well, also other people, Mike Shalansky, uh, Dick Weisenberg, developed the approaches and then once we had figured out that it wasn't just in mitosis, but it was present all over, and particularly in brain, and that was just a, as we said, it, we were testing to see if it was a distribution of binding related to mitosis, and the brain was the control, and that changed our thinking, because clearly this was a widespread protein, which was in mitosis, but was all over the place. Well, now we, we know it's a widespread protein, but at that time when we got the brain result, it was very puzzling. It was. It was very puzzling. So the idea was to uh, assay different tissues varying in mitotic index, and the expectation was those tissues high in mitotic index would have high colchicine binding, brain very low in mitotic index should be very low, and then we got this astounding result that brain was very high. and now. The students at that time would meet around Botany Pond and talk about results, and I remember very distinctly all, you know, our, my fellow students were saying it's clearly an artifact of this drug uh, partitioning into the membranes of uh, nerve cells because they're so rich in membrane structure being with all the neuronal processes. So it's an artifact. So, it, so we didn't immediately conclude from the brain result that this was telling us something about the widespread nature of uh, the colchicine binding protein tubulin. Uh, we had to do further tests. One further test was to take advantage of a previous laboratory association that you had, Ed, if you recall, uh, when you had your adventure in Chile and getting <laughs> squid axoplasm from the marine station in Chile. And so we, you arranged to get some of that shipped up to us and we tested it. And we thought that uh, if there's something important in brain, it might be even more abundant in the pure axoplasm, and in fact it was. And this would also provide a test for whether or not the drug was partitioning into membranes because the membranes wouldn't be present in the axoplasm. And, uh, and here this positive result gave us um, reassurance that uh, maybe it wasn't an artifact, this binding in brain, but it had a deeper significance. And it's around that time, uh, as I recall, that uh, I came out to Woods Hole, or around that time, maybe we don't have the sequence right, uh, but I came out to Woods Hole to learn how to isolate spindles and extract protein from spindles. And we also learned how to isolate sperm tails and cilia and flagella because those systems also have microtubules and the word microtubules had only recently been coined because of the introduction of a new fixative that preserved them, and previously they hadn't been preserved. So um, uh, I learned how to uh, isolate mitotic spindles here and extract the protein in a more gentle way than had been done previously, uh, and found that the, we could identify the colchicine binding protein with the same molecular properties. We used sedimentation at that time to identify how rapidly it moved in a centrifugal field. So it had the same properties as the colchicine binding protein from cells and from brain. And so then we felt uh, there was something real here. We had the same molecule from these different sources and we asked uh, what's the structural basis? Is there a structural basis for this? And the structure that we saw that was in common among all these sources was uh, the microtubule. And that's when we made that suggestion. That. Yeah, because we hadn't been able to do the, the crucial experiment. The crucial experiment was to take this purified protein and turn it into microtubules. And we struggled. And we struggled with that. And I think we sometimes got some polymerization, but we never really were able to quantitate it. I think, I'm not sure, but I think you made, we had some microscopy, electron microscopy. We made rings, I think. We made rings. There was also this confounding uh, protein that we extracted from the spindles, this uh, very large protein that had a cylindrical shape that at one time we thought could be the subunit of microtubules, but it turned out to be yolk protein. That's, yeah. That was another oh, yes. red herring and blind alley in this study. Do you recall uh, the discussion of the naming uh -uh, of the this naming. protein? Yes, we got scooped on that. We should have named the protein. We should have named the protein, but do you recall that uh, I think it was in your office and we were talking about what we should name the protein. I, I recall a discussion where we said, um, well, it's a 
microtubule, so the subunit uh, could be called tubulin, uh, with in being the t common suffix for a protein, but it didn't sound very good to our ears, and we, we reverted to the name colchicine binding protein. Yeah. Name. Mori, Hideo Mori, uh, later felt that clearly the protein needed a name, and so gave the protein the obvious name. Yeah. But for several years, uh, we in the literature referred to it as, only as the colchicine binding protein. Yeah. What do we take as uh, messages that we might give to students watching? Well, you, you gave and I gave the same message. Choose an important problem. And when you're just starting out, choose what you think is the most important problem. And I thought that was the most important, and so did Gary when he joined the lab. And that's the first important thing. Don't work on a trivial problem. Do something. If you succeed, uh, you have done something really good. And don't be confined in your thinking because we thought we were doing one thing, isolating something specific to mitosis because of our thinking, which was, well, colchicine is specifically blocking mitosis, and therefore it's probably some protein that's specific. And what we found as we went on, we were completely wrong. It turned out to be not only general, but one of the most important fibrous proteins in the cell. So I would add to that uh, the observation that sometimes when you're doing work you encounter apparently contradictory results. You encounter a paradox. Don't sweep it under the carpet. Look at it more deeply because sometimes the, the deepest understanding comes from resolving those paradoxes. We had a Morrissey Taylor, take one. Okay, let's go. Drop everything, we're going to work on the brain. That's how I remember it. And then you, you and, well, Mike. I think it was, okay, see, so this is interesting. So we, we, we may need to uh, compare some notes and check some things for, for yeah. accuracy. My recollection is that the first uh, hints of binding in, in brain actually came before I came to Woods Hole, and part of the motivation for coming to Woods Hole oh. was to um, look at isolation of the spindle again to try to resolve this paradoxical result with the brain tissue. Hmm. And then, uh, okay. so that, so, uh, now we can check that, of course, <laughs> if we just look at our own papers and, and, uh, and, and notes. We no longer have the notebooks. <laughs> but, so I, I thought that actually okay. came first, but... Maybe it doesn't matter. Morrissey Taylor, take three. I recall having to beg you to get into the, onto the project <laughs> because you said that it was not fit for a graduate student. It was too risky. Ah, you, well, that's worth bringing up. Do you remember that? <laughs> I so, may have said that, yeah. Uh -huh. I, also, also, I had to beg to go to Woods Hole, which ah. I think you discouraged strongly because it would be you know, uh, yeah, letting your graduate student go away. You don't want to let the, the graduate <laughs> student leave the lab. Yeah, it's sort right. of a fundamental principle. Right. Morrissey Taylor, take 42. You decided at some point, and I guess I never asked you this, you decided at some point um, that it was worth uh, investigating the mechanism of action of that drug. What made you, what led you to that conclusion? Yeah, well, See, I, you should have taped this. This is better than what you're going to get. I have been. <laughs> you have been? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I've taped everything. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, 